It's indeed very good to see everyone who purposed to come back tonight at the five o'clock hour. We're looking at the seven cries from Calvary. I do really appreciate the songs that Brother Tim has led us in both this morning and this evening. They really help us focus upon Jesus while he was upon that cross. We're looking at the last six hours of his life and as we've said, we're noticing seven cries from Calvary. Now I want to review for just a second because if nothing else, hopefully we'll all be very familiar with these cries, possibly in the order that they were uttered. The first study that we looked at, words of forgiveness, Luke 23 and verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Again, words of forgiveness. Second, words of assurance. Jesus in Luke 23 and verse 43 to the penitent thief, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Also, the third cry, words of affection. John records these in John 19 verses 26 and 27. When Jesus turns his attention upon his mother and says, Woman, behold your son. And then to John, behold your mother. And of course, what we looked at this morning, the fourth cry from Calvary, words of despair, found in Matthew 27 and verse 46, also found in Mark 15 and verse 34. But remember, this is when Jesus states, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, of course, tonight, in this fifth cry, we're looking at words of suffering. In John 19 and verse 28, in just a moment, we'll read those words that we've already heard. I thirst. Let's focus our attention upon Jesus. At this time, he's on the cross. And because of that, let me make mention of something so important, not only to this series, but to our understanding concerning the Bible. The centrality of the cross. Think about this with me. The cross is at the center of God's plan. That's why Paul said, I desired to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2. Also, the cross is at the center of our Lord's mission. You remember in Hebrews 12 and verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Also, the cross is at the center of heaven's message. You remember in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18, the preaching of the cross, some translations say the message of the cross to those who are perishing is foolishness. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Likewise, the cross is at the center of our obedience. You remember what Jesus said in John 12 and verse 32? This is cryptic language, but he's speaking concerning his crucifixion when he said, If I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. That lifting up is cryptic. It's speaking concerning his crucifixion. But again, the cross is at the center of our obedience. The cross should be at the center of our lives. In Luke 9 and verse 23, if any man wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. The words, again, of Jesus. The cross has a bitter, sweet message, doesn't it? The bitterness is that one, meaning Jesus, had to die for our sins. But the sweetness is that that one, Jesus, did just that that he was willing, that he was obedient to death, even death of the cross. Philippians 2 and verse 8. Again, the cross of Christ 
is the greatest expression of cruelty known to mankind, humanity. Without a doubt, this is so. Remember in John 15 and verse 25, Jesus said, They hated me without cause. Josephus, when he was speaking concerning crucifixion, he called crucifixion, quote, the most wretched of deaths. Cicero, a Roman statesman and philosopher, he said this of crucifixion. He said it was the most cruel and shameful of all punishments. And so it is. The cross of Christ is the greatest expression of cruelty known to humanity. The cross of Christ is also the greatest expression of love known to mankind. Remember John 15, 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. That's exactly what Jesus did. I know that this is Old Testament. I know that this is not prophecy concerning Christ, His death on the cross. But the words that God speaks to Israel are also words that Jesus could speak to all humanity. In Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, God tells Israel, I have loved you with an everlasting love. When we see our Lord upon the cross, when we understand its message, its meaning for our life, then and only then do we realize that, yes, Jesus has loved us with an everlasting love. And also consider this. The cross should be the object of our constant uh, contemplation and meditation. That's why we're looking at this series. Truly it should be. Christ and His cross should be part of our thinking. It's part of our lives. It should be woven into our very fiber as we go throughout this life. Let's look at John 19 and verse 28. Again, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. This morning we looked at a passage one that someone has said the most difficult in all the Bible to explain. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, tonight we're going to just the opposite. So simple, so straightforward. I thirst. I want you to keep this in mind. Matthew records only one saying. It's the one we've looked at this morning, Matthew 27 and verse 46. Notice Mark does the same thing. Mark also only records one saying. And it's interesting, this is the same one that Matthew records. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Matthew and Mark only have one of these seven sayings, and it's the same one. But notice Luke records three. And these three sayings are all unique to the book of Luke. You don't find them in Matthew, nor Mark, nor John. Again, John records three. And just like we said concerning Luke, you don't find these in any other account of the life of Christ. They're all unique to the book of John. And of course, the middle one, John 19 and verse 28, is what our attention is upon this evening. I thirst. These words help us to understand Jesus is not only the Son of God. He is that. But He is the Son of Man. The humanity of Jesus is clearly seen in the declaration, I thirst. You remember John 1 and verse 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But when you drop down in John's account in verse 14 of chapter 1, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The reality is Jesus became flesh. Yes, He was deity, but yes, He was human. Yes, He's the Son of God. Yes, He's the Son of Man. And these words tonight, I thirst, they really do 
they fully depict the humanity of Jesus. Think about this. This is the only statement in which Jesus refers to his physical suffering. Now think back of what we've already looked at. Father, forgive them. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son. He's not even focusing his attention then upon himself. It's about others. In Matthew 27 and verse 46, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's dealing with his relationship with his Father. But this again, this statement, is the only one that refers to his physical suffering. After this, he's going to make two more statements. He's going to utter two more cries. It's finished. And Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So this is the only one wherein Jesus focuses his attention upon his suffering, upon his agony. And all he says regarding that is, I thirst. Quite amazing, isn't it? It has been said that thirst is one of the severest agonies of crucifixion. Also, his thirst is better understood when we remember the fatigue with which he had undergone, the grief he had felt, the heat of the day, the loss of blood. All of these are natural causes for his thirst. Now, just one of these would have been enough. But when you combine all of this and even more that happened to him, Again, we see the reason why Jesus says, I thirst. His humanity is clearly depicted in the scriptures since he was hungry. You remember in Matthew 4 and verse 2, he has fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He's in the wilderness and he became hungry. That shows us concerning his humanity. He was hungry. He slept. Remember in Mark 4, in verse 38, when that storm comes up on the sea, Jesus is sleeping underneath in his cabin. Again, he ate in Luke 7, in verse 36, when he's invited to come to the house of Simon the Pharisee. He went so that he could eat. Again, he became weary in John 4, when he was traveling through Samaria, when he met the woman at the well, the Bible tells us he was weary. All of these teaching us something concerning his humanity, helping us to understand, yes, indeed, he became flesh. He was indeed the Son of Man. He wept in John 11 and verse 35 at the graveside of Lazarus. He suffered. That's what Hebrews 5 and verse 8 tells us. Although he were a son, yet he learned obedience to the things which he suffered and was thirsty. The passage we're looking at, John 19 and verse 28. So you think about all of these things. What are they revealed for? Why are they recorded? To help us understand his humanity. To help us realize that, yes, it was needful, it was necessary for him to be made in the likeness of his brethren in all things. And the reason in Hebrews 2 and in Hebrews 4 is that he might be a merciful high priest. Well, consider this. His thirst was prophesied. In Psalm 22 and in Psalm 69, both of these psalms messianic. Again, listen to the language. In Psalm 22 and verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. Notice that. I thirst. His tongue clings to his jaws. Again, read Psalm 22 tonight, and at least 20 times you'll find reference to Jesus, and so many times to this time that we're dealing with right now, while he's upon the cross. In Psalm 69, in verse 21, 
They also gave me gall for, for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Well, that's exactly what has been depicted in John 19. Again, fulfillment of Scripture. It was prophesied concerning his thirst. In Psalm 69 and verse 3, you'll read the phrase, My throat is dry. Now again, go back to these psalms. See if they're not messianic. My throat is dry. My tongue clings to my jaws. And again, for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Well, the beauty and the irony. The beauty, first of all, is that Jesus was upon the cross in the first place. That he loved us enough to die in our place, in our stead. You remember John 10 and verse 11? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. But the beauty and the irony. Earlier we find Jesus thirsty on a journey John 4, verses 4 through 7. And now he is thirsty at journey's end. John 19 and verse 28. Our blessed Lord and Savior is about to expire. He's about to die. He's about to leave this realm. Again, after he says, I thirst, if you listen carefully to the scripture reading tonight, two verses later he's going to say, it is finished. And then in Luke 23, in verse 46, probably his last utterance, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. And so he has thirsted earlier on a journey, but now at journey's end, at life's end, he thirsts. Also, as he was poured out like water, he thirsted. Think about the irony of this. Again, in Psalm 22 and verse 14, the psalm that we noted was so messianic in its thrust, in its theme. This one is talking about was poured out like what? Poured out like water. That's what he longed for. And as he was poured out like water, he thirsted. Again, is it not striking? That the one who created all streams and fountains, who owns all wells and water brooks, who made all rivers, seas, and oceans, was thirsty. Is that not striking as we put that in perspective? Here is the very Son of God. Here is the Son of Man. He's created all water bodies. And he's thirsty. Notice also, he thirsted that he might lead us to the water of life. Remember what we said this morning? He was forsaken that we need never be. Well, think about tonight what we're saying. He was thirsty that we never thirst again. I want us to conclude tonight by reading some passages these are verses that deal with water in some respect. But I want us to keep these all in mind with what we're studying. Jesus, our blessed Lord, our Savior, Son of God, Son of Man, saying, I thirst. In Jeremiah 2 and verse 13, you remember in that context, God says, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. How tragic it is that the people in Jeremiah's day had rejected God, the fountain of living waters, but what they had turned to, what they made for themselves, were broken cisterns that which could hold no water. How different the language of Psalm 63 and verse 1 is. Listen to this verse. Compare this with what we just read. Psalm 63 and verse 1, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. 
My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. That verse should depict all of our lives. My soul thirsts for you. You see, we live in a dry and thirsty, a dry and weary land where there is no water. If we're not sustained of God and by God, we will not be sustained at all. When we reject the fountain of living waters, we have nothing to look forward to. We have nothing to turn to except cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Remember Matthew 5 and verse 6? Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled, they shall be satisfied. Again, there is that desire, there is that longing, the same thing the psalmist talked about. My soul thirsts for thee. We hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? Because only those will be satisfied. Only those will be filled. In John 6 and verse 35, it's interesting at the very end of that verse. Jesus says, he who believes in me will never thirst. The next chapter, John 7 and verse 37, Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Let's conclude tonight by going to the book of Revelation. Look what it says in the book of Revelation. Turn with me to Revelation 7. A question is going to be asked concerning those who have come out of the great tribulation. Who are these? Well, notice this. In Revelation 7, look at verse 14. It says, And I said to him, Sir, you know. Now, the question has been asked in verse 13. Uh, who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? Verse 14, And I, and I said to them, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. Now listen to this language. They shall never hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Do you remember what we said just a moment ago? He thirsted that He might lead us to waters of life. One last verse tonight in Revelation 22. Look at Revelation 22 and verse 17. Look what it says. It says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The one who said, I thirst, is the only one that can offer us the water of life. He thirsted that he might lead us to the water of life. Let me conclude by saying this. If we look at those words, I thirst, I believe we must look at them in the simplest explanation. I believe he's talking about his physical thirst. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But we've also noticed tonight that sometimes hunger and thirst are used not in the physical sense, but in the sense of longing, in the sense of desiring. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They long for righteousness. They desire righteousness. Why? That they might be filled, that they might be satisfied. I believe Jesus is still saying, I thirst in this sense. I thirst, meaning I long for your salvation. I thirst, I desire your obedience. 
I thirst. I long for you to come to me, even tonight. We know that's true. That's how Jesus lived. It's how he died. He ever lives to make intercession for us. He has not stopped being concerned about lost humanity. The Son of Man came that he might seek and save that which was lost. Luke 19 and verse 10. My friend, tonight, if you don't have the relationship with your Heavenly Father that you need, we're asking you tonight to make a decision. Come to Jesus, the one who was forsaken so that you need never be forsaken. The one who thirsted on your behalf so that he could lead you to waters of life. If you know what the Bible teaches and you're willing, ready to believe it, unite it with faith, and because of that belief, that faith, you're willing to repent of your sins, to confess Christ as Lord, that He is exactly who He claims to be, the very Son of God. And if it's your desire tonight to be baptized into Christ, that your sins might be washed away, we urge you, we ask you to come. Leave this dry and weary, thirsty land wherein there is no water and come tonight to the fountain of life, the fountain of water, everlasting life. Come to Jesus. Will you do that while together we stand and as we sing?